A big warm welcome to you, Lori. How are you doing today? I'm great, Lorene. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks so um, much for letting us participate. I'm excited to do this with you today. We're excited to have you here. And for those viewers who are just coming on, um, today we're here with TW Insurance. They're a Boom brand partner and they provide great home and auto insurance for our Boom members. And we have with us today, Lori Bauer. She is an expert in insurance and she's had experience over the last 15 years. And we're delighted to welcome you here today, Lori, to talk about recreational vehicle and seasonal property insurance. So yes. warm welcome, Lori Bauer from TW Insurance. Well, thanks, Lorene. Yes, I'm excited. Um, our, our summer season is short here, so we best get our vehicles insured and get on the road, right? That's right. And summer is finally on its way and on recreational its way. Um, properties and vehicles are more popular than ever as people are looking for ways to holiday in these unusual times. Maybe they're going to a campground, maybe they're going to go out and enjoy the great outdoors at a lake if they're lucky enough to have a cabin perhaps or a day visitor. And lots of us are really accustomed to home and auto insurance, but you today are going to talk about maybe a topic that's not as, as popular or maybe not as well known, which is insurance for recreational vehicles and seasonal properties. But before we get into that, I just wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about TW insurance and, and an insurance broker versus an insurance provider. Can you tell us briefly about that? Uh, for sure. So at TW, we are insurance brokers. We're an independent insurance brokerage. So we're not owned by any insurance company. Uh, that gives us the ability to focus on our customers' needs because our customers are our top priority. So as a broker, we have access to multiple insurance markets. We'll ask you the questions about your property or your recreational vehicle, and then we'll take your information out to market We'll solicit quotes, review them, and then come back to you with the coverage and the details and help you make a choice about what might be the best for you. Um, we're our strong, strong pillar for us is advocacy, whether it be in the claims process, if you have payment concerns or purchasing a policy, TW is there for every step of the way. Thank you. Now let's get into this recreational property let's insurance. Uh, property. Sure. Yeah. So what, what counts, let's start with vehicles. What counts as a recreational property? I mean, so, yeah, what as a, re, sorry, what counts as a recreational vehicle? See, I'm getting the two mixed up. No, so that's okay. Sure. And I'll, I'll help you understand both. So a recreational vehicle is a vehicle like a motor home or an ATV or a snowmobile that isn't a private passenger vehicle that you use on a daily basis. So of course, motorcycles kind of ride the middle, right? So there's dirt bikes or trail bikes. Um, motorcycles are in between, but they're still a special coverage because in Alberta, we can't use motorcycles year round. So there's a seasonality to it. Uh, recreational properties, those are like uh, camper trailers, truck campers, uh, towing trailers, the tent trailer, I suppose, and, uh, and cabins and cottages, of course. And thank you for that. So, so here's just a question for you that I was thinking about after we started talking about this. What if my, my recreational vehicle is parked in the garage? Because I think part of the confusion is, well, I'm, I'm not using it all year round and it's parked in my garage. Is it covered under my home insurance? How does that work? So home insurance policies have a really narrow definition of what a mode, what, what would they would cover in terms of motorized vehicles. So a motorized wheelchair or an e-bike or a lawnmower, that's as motorized as your property policy is interested in um, when vehicles are used that way. And the wordings usually specifically exclude motorized vehicles, campers, um, that trailers, that kind of thing thing. So there isn't covered under that policy. I guess the other thing I can let you know is that um, recreational vehicle coverage is priced with seasonality in mind. So you won't see the kind of rates for recreational uh, for third party liability that you would see on a vehicle you use for commute. When the insurance products are priced, 
they're priced with the understanding of the usage. So a snowmobile, well, you can't use that in July unless you're in Fort McMurray, sorry. <laughs> Maybe there, <laughs> but in most cases, right? So um, it's, you put the insurance on and it's priced so that it's um, appropriate. So you're not paying for coverage that you're never gonna use. What about um, for those recreational vehicles when it comes to other drivers, how do you make sure that, you know, my buddy's going to drive it or my child, like, how do you, what are they covered and, and how do you deal with that? Well, we always, uh, you know, the rule in insurance is lend your vehicle, lend your insurance. So um, someone who can, you know, and let's say someone over 18 or not your child, just a friend, um, they can unless they're not to, right? If they're prohibited, don't have a license, been barred from driving, typically there's not a concern. With underage operators, you really have to, um, Alberta Transportation and Insurance work together to determine what rules are and what rules aren't. Typically, if you're on your own property, so just your property, your child can use a, a quad. Um, there's always rules in place, but of course that's where they can as soon as they're not on your property, they're on public land, they're using it off-roadway, then um, the regulations that apply to all vehicles would apply. So then they have to be of a certain age, 14, I believe it is, and that's just off-road. And then uh, if they're on public roads, they have to be uh, licensed as an operator to operate whatever vehicle it is. So your 12-year-old can't burn down the road on a quad and be covered through insurance. Does that clarify it? It does, yes. Thank you very Perfect. much. Perfect, thanks. The same rules. <laughs> yes, essentially the same rules. That's right. Okay, here's a fun topic. Boats. Yes. What about boats? Are they okay, the same so as other recreational vehicles? They're not. Um, so boats um, are marine. Uh, and in Alberta, of course, when you live on a coast, you're a little more familiar with boats and usage and things, but in Alberta being landlocked, it's not a transportation form, um, but they're still, um, they're called, they're usually insured under a property policy. So some boats go under your homeowner's policy. Uh, there's rules in place and your own policy, like you would want to talk to your personal insurance provider to see what guidelines there are. Uh, usually the value, the age, the horsepower, um, create some parameters that the insurance companies will take on or will not take on as a risk in your homeowner's policy. Having said that, there are a number of companies that provide very good coverage for your boats and they're specific to a boat. So they provide coverage specific. It includes the boat, uh, the motor, accessories, equipment, skis, things like that. And then also liability because your boat, if you have a high power boat, you have a liability exposure. That comes to your homeowner's policy unless you insure it elsewhere. So that's where the guidelines come in, not only for the physical damage, but also the responsibility that your boat, you have as a boat owner to damage you might cause to someone else or their property. Now, um, boats are funny too, because um, they're, it's, waterways are federally governed, but you do need a pleasure craft operator's license to operate boats in Alberta. And that's the same as sea dues. Someone sick, under 16 cannot operate a sea dew legally, and they have to have a, the pleasure craft operator license to use a sea dew as well. Oh, I didn't realize that. And I was going to ask you about sea dews actually. So would they be would they be insured with the similar considerations? I know they don't carry as much accessories, et cetera, but would they fall under the same uh, category as a as a boat? Yeah, they do. They are. I mean, again, you know, there's guidelines or rules. It might go under your home insurance. You can always check that first. Um, if you have a, you know, whatever your your particular item is, you need to look at that particular one. So um, you can look under your homeowner's insurance, but there are a number of um, policies that will cover speed sea dues. Uh, the best thing to make sure you ask when it's covered. Sea dues have a really specific, it's obvious why. They're easy to steal. If you leave it on the shore, someone could just take your sea dew away, right? So they do have certain conditions. So that's a really important part when you're working with your broker, your insurance provider, to ask the questions about that so that you're not caught unaware. I just had a uh, question come in on leasing. So what about if you're leasing an RV or, or you know, is the insurance 
as part of that lease or do you have to acquire insurance for this lease separately? Okay, so if you're leasing, so short term rental or long term rental, I guess. So yeah. I always think of leasing as a long term rental. So that would be okay. Um, you would lease it, it, it would be fine to do that. Um, short term rentals, uh, your policy, like a traditional auto policy, wouldn't cover the rental of a, a motorcycle. There's definitions and guidelines within it. So again, you have to ask if you already have a motorcycle policy, maybe you can rent one, right? But that's, again, I, I know that I sound like a bit of an echo or a, a, a broken record here, but there's not as much standardization as, as would make it a bit simpler. Okay. So it's always best to ask because then you know what you're dealing with, right? Yeah. If they're asking too about RVs and I assume it's the same thing. You know, don't assume that you have the coverage, reach out to your broker, make sure that you have the right coverage in place for that short-term RV rental you might be doing to do that cross Canada trip when it's safe to do so, et cetera. Yeah. So let's talk about properties. Okay. Uh, many of us dream of having a cabin or a seasonal property we can go to one day, but for those of us that do or are considering it or are new to it, um, what kind of, I mean, obviously you need insurance for that, but what kind of insurance or coverage do you, re do you recommend for a cabin or a seasonal property? So I guess um, there's two, two big things in it is, is it a year round cabin that you can access 12 months a year or is it a summer cabin? And um, in order for it to qualify as the type that you um, access 12 months a year, it has to have accessible roads 12 months a year. And um, I'm a city dweller, so that sounds so bizarre to me, but I fully understand that there's certain areas where, you know, the roads aren't cleared because nobody's going there or it's, it's summer use only. So there's two types of insurance that way. And um, the other thing to really make sure is what you're covered for, because if you have your property insured that you just go during the summer months, and, and it's like a totally, it's, it's a cabin, right? In that case, you might not have the full scope of coverage, like burglary might not be on that policy or vandalism or coverage for malicious acts because the insurance is purchased with the understanding that nobody's there a lot at the time. So it's essentially, it's not vacant, but it's not occupied all the time. There's like a 60 day rule that sits in the, that window, like is it used unoccupied for more than 60 days at a time right that's the kind of standard so you just need to have the coverage if it's you know based on on how you use it and what you keep in it so do you have to inspect it when it's not in use depends on the insurance company and what you've told them so if you said that you use it as a year round that you're going every 60 days it's not so much that you're inspecting it, but you're using it to the way the terms and conditions that you told us about that we discussed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, uh, there's not always that standardization. I would say, yes, you should, but I don't know that the insurance coverage wouldn't kick, you know, uh, provide coverage. So I think again, best to check with you, the policy. And when you're purchasing it asks like, so what do I have to do? Do I have to be there every 60 days? What if I don't go? Because during COVID, there were times that none of us were allowed to leave the city, right? So you couldn't go inspect it. So you can't be held accountable for something you can't control, but it's best to understand it at the onset. And then you, you have far fewer issues after, right? Right. And sometimes you can't get to them depending on the location of the cabin, right? Or, you know, in Ontario, there were certainly restrictions for a while that people couldn't, you know, travel. So then you can't go to your cabin, right? It's, it's pro prohibited. So I just had another question come in from one of the sure. listeners, viewers. They're wondering when you tow a trailer, do you need to have extra liability insurance? Well, I would certainly want it because towing a trailer is kind of outside of my skill set. <laughs> yeah, so we've been talking about property, not so much about campers um, towing trailers. So uh, I guess trailers can be two things. There's trailers that have a cabin on it, right? Like a, a travel trailer, or there's just a trailer that hauls. So your boat trailers, motorcycle trailers, right? They all need liability coverage, but it comes from the vehicle that's pulling it, uh. right? Um, and the reason being is that without the vehicle, it doesn't actually have any mobility. So it's not motorized, but it is on the road. 
And therefore, of course, could do damage to somebody else. Therefore, then again, the requirement for third party liability insurance. So, so that is required. And then on top of it, that's the basic, like that's the minimum you need to do is just protect everybody else on the road from whatever you own. That's your first step. Secondly, is do you want to protect it, your own investment? Did you know you've paid X dollars? Do you want collision coverage? Do you need this coverage? Um, or have you financed it and your lien holder says you must have coverage and provide that as a condition of sale or a condition of finance, right? There's those, those stipulations in place as well. Thank you. So I'm just wondering if I did have, let's say, either a recreational property or a vehicle um, and was going to pick up the phone and call my broker or somebody new, what are sort of the key things I should be prepared to ask? So um, having your bill of sale is really good. I know that sounds kind of corny, but um, it has the, you know, the serial number and all that information and VIN numbers or serial numbers, uh, particularly with motorcycles and, and things that provide a lot of information to your insurer or the, the pr insurance provider. So that does help. Uh, you need to know how old the vehicle is. Um, if it's brand new, that's all very easy information. If you've purchased a used vehicle, you need your purchase price. Um, uh, those kind of things as well. If it's brand new, you need the vehicle supplement to, you know, for brand new. And then from there, it's about protecting what you've purchased. And then uh, some, there's application forms that you might need to complete that you'll need um, documentation. When you buy, buy a boat, you need to understand the host horsepower. When you buy a motorcycle, you need to know that. There's um, information, as much information as you can provide us gives us the best opportunity to get the best rate, right? The more information, the better you can underwrite it and the better access to the, to the more preferred rates. Perfect, thank you. And when you think about property, so are there things that I can do in my, so I own this cabin somewhere uh, in my dreams, but one day, hopefully I own a cabin. Are there things that I can do as a cabin owner or a recreational property owner to help reduce the cost of the insurance? Or are there key things I need to have in place? I'm, I'm just thinking you have this piece of property sitting unoccupied for extended periods. You know, what are the, some of the things that you can do that can help alleviate some of the cost or or are there things the insurance company recommends that will help keep your property safe? Well, there's a couple of things. So um, if there's some stuff is out of your control, like the distance from the fire hall is, is not within your control, obviously. But having said that, when you're purchasing a property, you know, if you're out looking, that's something you can ask them, like, where's the responding fire hall? Because unprotected properties that no fire hall really, you know, like not, not city, um, uh, definitely is more costly. Uh, deductibles, managing your deductibles is always a good idea when it comes to insurance and, and being willing to take some of that risk on your own. Uh, proper maintenance is really important. Keep that property in good condition. Uh, I would say that you need to secure the risk for what you've got inside of it as well. Um, maybe, you know, your cabin that you only go to every 90 days is not the place for your top end TV. Um, items that are easily stolen, um, heirloom items, you probably don't want to keep things that you're not going to be able to protect very well, you're not going to want out there. Mm -hmm. If you do have items like that, then you do want to consider or noting the area, uh, do you need coverage for vandalism, you know, um, the other thing is to make sure that you're using CSA approved heating devices and that when you're, you know, heating your cabin and, and or installing wood stoves, that you are working with your broker or your insurance provider to have those conversations and understand what will increase the risk and create a surcharge, what will help minimize the risks, um, where the insurance company is most comfortable. Electric heating, like if you think about those plug in baseboard heaters. I don't personally know how many fires they're responsible for a year, but I know that that can be a problem, right? So how you heat your, your, your property might, might be um, a part of it. Another thing is to make sure that when you put your uh, vacation trailer away for the year, don't forget when you're storing it, that rodents love them. 
and they're not accessed, right? They're in a storage unit or whatever it is. Um, rodents get in there and, and they don't have our sense of manners. Like they don't think, oh, this is somebody else's property at best not. Uh, I have a friend who squirrels got in and filled every inch of her vacation trailer with, with acorns. I mean, oh my gosh. every place you could even think of was just packed full of them because they thought they had the, the best property ever. They, he really, that guy did a really good job of getting ready for winter. He even had a, tra a trailer <laughs> set up. Isn't that great? <laughs> Squirrels are a problem, yes. So do they protect are. those. Yes. We have a, another question that just came in, if you don't mind. They are asking, uh -huh. if you are looking to buy a seasonal property, anything any, are there any red flags in the insurance world that they should look for oh older properties that haven't been maintained i mean um your insurance policy doesn't respond when maintenance hasn't been done right that that's the the big problem if, uh, is is the maintenance on it so you'll want um the property to have you know be as updated as it can be you don't want big holes in the roof or things like that um either have or be, if it, if some are bare, right? Some cabins are four walls, no heating, and that's okay, as long as you're not storing valuable items without heat, but um, it's maintenance for sure, fire hall, access to a fire hall. Uh, you can ask around too, like, is there a lot of vandals in this area? Like, what's it like around here? Uh, you know, survey it. Um, I would ask the neighbors over the realtor, because I, a realtor is going to tell you the best and most positive you might want to ask around but yeah it's it's typically the maintenance you want a, um, a building that's been well maintained so that you know what you're buying and it'll hold up to the test of time exactly thank you uh, somebody tuned in here they must have come in after we answered this originally but just if you could reiterate for us is there a need to have someone check on your property once a month for example so it, um as we were saying that that um, you can ensure it as a seasonal that is only used in the summer or more of a, a secondary homeowners almost that you use it year round. Uh, that one, the one that you use year, year round, uh, you've pretty much said that it will be occupied at least every 60 days. That's the way the insurance is set up because and that 60 days is not written in stone it sort of um, varies. So again, best to check with your own provider. I, I feel like a broken record, I apologize. Well, I just can't answer for everybody. So, um, but if you've said uh, it's, it's really in the terms and conditions of the policy and the broker that you're working with will be able to tell you whether that's important or not. Thank you. Yes. Is there anything you wanna say in closing when it comes to recreational vehicles or seasonal properties that we should know about? Um, I would say to, to be very honest with the usage of it um, and, and tell people how you're using it. I would also tell you that they're intended as temporary dwellings. So in almost every case, the liability in uh, like a vacation trailer or a camper, say, uh, the liability is actually backed by your, your homeowner's policy. It's sort of that way. They don't have liability on their own um, for a vacation trailer. So it isn't something you can live in except on a temporary basis. It is intended as a temporary dwelling. So uh, govern yourself accordingly. If that's your only or principal dwelling, just know what your risks are. That that's that would be what or ask ask your broker. <laughs> ask your broker. <laughs> Always ask the broker. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like Thank a parent. You. Well, thank, thank you. you. This has been really informative. Thank you so very much, Lori, in particular if it's a new topic. And I think we're finding that there are a lot of people who are looking to get into, I have a friend who just bought a little travel trailer. It's the cutest little thing. And she and her dog are going to go off and explore the province when it's appropriate and use this trailer. So, but she's brand new to it. And, you know, I think there are many people who can tell that story today where they've had the chance to look at exploring more of 
their area and using recreational vehicles, perhaps a boat or a sea dew, maybe they can rent a cabin for a month or two, and, but they bought a boat that they're gonna use in the water. So lots of unique situations. So important for everybody to, as you say, check with your broker when it comes time, make sure that you're covered appropriately, ask all those questions. If you didn't ask all the questions at the first time you spoke to them, call again, just that's yes. why they're there, they're there to help. So, you know, a very big welcome, uh, thank you, sorry, to you, Lori, and to TW. You, as I said, have been a longstanding partner of Boom, and Boom members do get great insurance rates from TW. And all that Boom members need to do is log into the site. They'll find you in there, and they can give you a call and get uh, rates on their various properties and their vehicles. So thank you for being with us today and sharing some of your expertise on this topic. Really valuable. Lori, thank you. Well, thank you, Lorraine, and thank you. Boom offers a lot of great savings and deals to PEEP members, too. So it's it's very exciting to be a part of the Boom program. Um, I've used a few of the deals myself, and uh, I'm on a shopping moratorium just right now, but I'll uh, get back to it shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lori, thank you, and thank you to TW, and thank you to our members who joined us today, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody again soon for another session in our series on an upcoming topic. Everybody take care. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.